Good morning and welcome to the programme. We're broadcasting live from Cardiff to ask you for your help with police appeals from up and down the country. Like the mystery over the identity of a woman found outside a hospital in London in excruciating pain. And it was later found that she had 61 bags of cocaine within her system. There has been no more additional information. She's remained as St. Helier woman and has done for nearly the last 20 years. That and more on today's Crime Watch Live. She's been jamming the switchboard both here and at the Institute of Women. Just to remind you, this was the abduction and radio drop campaign and the handgun debate. Hello and welcome to Crime Watch 12. People rang in giving the same this fantastic results. And thanks for joining us. Today, an audacious thief who dressed up as a delivery driver to nick people's packages. Police got more than they bargained for when they brought him in for questioning. He was extremely keen to tell us where he had been active. He even volunteered information to suggest that he'd been burglaring in other parts of Cardiff. We'll be discovering how 3D printing is building a picture of complex crimes. You've seen how the visualisations that we can create from our CT scans are very, very helpful to the jury when explaining very complex and sometimes very distressing cases. And hearing from heptathlete Kelly Southerton about why she turned to Crime Watch when her gold medal was stolen. Today's officers will be with us for the next 45 minutes, along with some of our team ready to take your calls. To get in touch, you can scan the QR code below using your phone's camera, which will take you through to our homepage. Or you can call us on 08000 468 999. If you prefer to text us, you can. It's 63399. Text crime, leave a space, then write your message. Or you can email us at cwl at bbc.co.uk. But first today, we've got an appeal from right here in Cardiff. DI Daniel Todd is here to tell us more. Daniel, thanks so much for, for coming in today. So let's start by you just telling us a bit more about when and where this sexual assault happened. OK, so the incident occurred on the 12th of May earlier this year. A young female victim, just 23 years of age, uh, had been on a night out with her friends in Cardiff City Centre, was making her way home uh, when she was approached by uh, a man and sexually assaulted. In the pink here, there's just this pink line, we've actually got the route to, that the victim took. Just explain the, the context of this map for us, Daniel. OK, so the incident started at uh, Pulse Nightclub, which is on Churchill Way uh, in the city centre, just off Queen Street, which is the main thoroughfare which runs through, uh, through, runs through town. She then made her way onto Windsor Place, uh, onto St Andrew's Crescent, onto St Andrew's Place, uh, and then she was attacked whilst underneath the bridge uh, that leads onto Salisbury Road. Just an absolutely awful thing to have happened, isn't it? Um, you've actually managed to gather a fair bit of CCTV from the night. So let's play the first clip and you can just talk us through what we can see. OK, so this is the suspect uh, entering Pulse nightclub uh, in the early hours of the 12th of May. Uh, our victim, uh, who's been blurred out to protect her identity, is uh, leaving uh, at the same time as he's entering. Uh, and what's quite chilling about this is the way in which he positions his body mm. uh, across her uh, to ins ensure that she has to brush past him as he goes past. Yeah. Um, as soon as then she, she leaves the, uh, the club, he turns immediately around, as can be seen there, uh, and follows her uh, through the streets of Cardiff. Now we've got some more CCTV. This is from outside of the club, as you say, following the victim. Yeah, so he spent a period of time following her a distance. He's actually made an effort here to cross the road uh, to, to create that distance between himself and the victim who's, who's actually in the top right-hand corner of the screen. Um, as they follow up then onto um, St Andrew's Place, he then quickens up, uh, approaches her, and, and it's out of shot of camera just underneath the bridge that leads onto Salisbury Road uh, is where the attack happens. Mm. He engages her in very sexually explicit conversation uh, before placing his hand up her skirt uh, and grabbing her around the neck. It's terrible and, and quite scary to see the footage of him following her, knowing exactly what he's doing. We've actually got some CCTV from after the incident as well, haven't we? Yes, we have, yeah. So this is him returning back into the city centre, you know, walking quite nonchalantly. Uh, he heads back to Pulse nightclub 
um, where he sort of loiters around outside, also outside the capital centre. Um, he then makes his way up Queen Street. Uh, we see him in a convenience store afterwards, uh, which we've got some stills of, um, before heading up Newport Road, City Road, uh, heading in the general direction uh, of Whitchurch Road uh, and the sort of Cattays area. And this is where we believe he is staying or residing with somebody in that sort of locality. Daniel, the, the victim has actually provided an impact statement, hasn't she, which I'm going to read out now. Uh, the victim said to us that the attack has had a lasting effect on her. She thinks about it every day and she now has trouble sleeping. It's made her anxious and it's taken her weeks to leave the house. Um, was she able to provide a description of the man? Yes, she has. So the male's described as sort of Middle Eastern in appearance, uh, approximately in his 20s uh, age-wise. Uh, about five foot eleven in height, uh, dark hair, dark eyes, uh, quite a well kept uh, facial hair. Uh, on the night in question, he was wearing quite a distinctive beige or greyish uh, gilet uh, that was uh, unzipped with a white t shirt on underneath, dark trousers. Daniel, really appreciate you coming in this morning and telling us more. Uh, that image is really clear, so if you recognise him, we're going to keep that image on our website. You can take another look, but if you do, please do get in touch. The contact details are on the screen. Later, we'll be talking to barrister Caroline Hohey, who was part of the team that brought the biggest human trafficking gang in the UK to justice. But before that, an appeal for information about an unknown woman left to die outside a hospital. Our mission is to bring hope and resolution to the 13,000 long-term missing persons and uh, unidentified cases in the UK. Daniela Mina is a volunteer with the charity Locate International. The Kate International is dedicated to finding long-term missing people and naming the unidentified, basically ensuring everything that can be done has been done. We don't stop appealing until that case is resolved. One of our media appeals at the moment is someone who became known as St. Helier Woman. On the 29th of May 2006, a woman was found in the car park of St. Helier Hospital by a passers-by. She was feeling very, very unwell. And she was taken uh, to the hospital where she was treated. She gave her name as Mary Kufi. She had no identifying documents on her person. She gave her birthday as the 27th of April, 1957. She said she was 47 years old, so there's a slight mismatch there. She mentioned that she had flown in from Ghana that morning, but we don't know whether or not she originally was from Ghana or that she may have been uh, just passing through. According to hospital staff, she spoke English well with an African accent. she deteriorated quite significantly. Sadly, she died in hospital. And it was later found that she had 61 bags of cocaine um, within her system. Despite an ongoing police investigation, there has been no more additional information to aid her identification. She's remained as St. Helier woman and has done for nearly the last 20 years. Retired detective Phil Brewer is a specialist advisor on modern slavery at the Human Trafficking Foundation. I was approached by the charity Locate um, about their St Helia woman case. There were some certain indicators within that story that she could potentially be a, a victim of, of exploitation, of, of modern slavery, and placing drugs within her body and then travelling the distance to the UK. And the fact that no one of any significance has come forward with any information also raises some concerns about whether she was in a situation that has provoked some fear in, in people coming forward. 
the sad thing is that when you consider a human being in terms of modern slavery and, and human trafficking, they're actually a, a relatively um, cheap commodity. And it really brings home the fact that we are talking about humans that traffickers consider extremely disposable. Our belief is whoever dropped her off um, at the hospital may be the key to solving this case and identifying, say, head AR women. I think it would be very easy to reflect on the chain of events that brought her to the hospital that day. We are not here to judge. We're here to find out what happened to her, find out what her name is, and bring her back to her family. Being from a African background myself, I really connected to that aspect of her life. And I think her being here on her own also really struck me as to how scary and how isolating that experience must have been for her. And to be unidentified for such a considerable amount of time when her family are probably looking for answers, to me that is what drives me every day, um, knowing that I can contribute into reuniting them in, in some way or another. I'm joined now by Dave Grinstead from Locate International. Thanks for coming in, Dave. Uh, can you tell us any more about this truly sad mystery? Well, it's really tragic circumstances. You try and imagine if this was your daughter who died alone, St Helios Hospital nearly 20 years ago on the uh, 29th of May 2006. 61 small packages of cocaine in her body. And you can imagine the, the impact that, that that had on her. And for us, it's about trying to find her name, that one person who might be able to return that to her. It'd be so important. You say 61 packages. We've actually recreated in the studio what that would look like. Now, these are the same size and packaged in the same way as what would have been inside that poor woman when she died. I mean, it's just staggering when you see it like that. She would have been in so much pain. But she was able to give just some details about her, her situation to the hospital staff. Yeah, despite the, the amount of pain that she was in, the fact that she was alone, she was able to give, give the name Mary Koofy or Coffee. We don't know exactly how that was spelt. We hope that that's her real name. I mean, it was at that moment in time when she was in so much pain uh, and getting treatment. And she gave a date of birth as well which again, we don't know if that's correct, but again, in the circumstances, we hope that, that it is so the 27th of April, 1957. So it, it would roughly, you know, it would, it would seem to tie up, it's certainly thereabouts, but also where she'd come in from, a place in Ghana. Yeah, so from Accra, from Ghana, the police had checked the, the manifest that she'd come in to, to Heathrow. Um, and, and she's quite distinctive. We don't know if she went from the UK to, to Ghana and then came back again. But she's quite distinctive. I mean, she, she's five foot nine. She's wearing a really bright piece of clothing with the yellow, black and, and red. And she had a, a handkerchief with the Argent Swallow logo on it, which is quite an unusual logo with Chinese writing um, underneath it. Yeah, distinctive dress, as you say. I've also got the shoes that she was wearing as well, which we can see here. We just need to piece together as many clues as possible to find out who this lady was. and. One of the things that's quite interesting is that the hospital itself is not that close to any major airport. We know she came into Heathrow. There's plenty of other hospitals closer to that. And that could be significant in itself about how she got there. Yeah, um, just being dumped at St Helier's Hospital, being stripped of all her identity, no passport, no money, um, all her identity taken away from her. We know that she came into to Heathrow Airport. We know that the hospitals aren't close to there. So where was she travelling to? And it's nearly 20 years now. You know, allegiances change. Somebody might feel compelled to, to come forward. Or we might have somebody who's looking at their family tree and have that gap in the family tree. And we just want to return this lady's name to her. Yes, absolutely. Well said, Dave. Um, have a look. If you have any knowledge about this case, or, or perhaps you recognise this image of this woman, please do call in. Our contact details are below. 
Now, it's estimated there are at least 100,000 victims of modern slavery and human trafficking in the UK. I'm joined now by Caroline uh, Hohi, uh, a barrister, to, to find out more. Caroline, thanks so much for, for coming in this morning. Let's, let's start by just explaining exactly what human trafficking is. So human trafficking is the movement of a human being from one location to another. It doesn't have to be international, doesn't have to be cross borders. It can be moving them from here to another address within Cardiff to another address mm. within England. But it is the movement with the intention of exploiting that human being. And there, there are different types of human trafficking, as we can see there, aren't there? Yes, it can be anything from sex trafficking for prostitution, uh, forced and compulsory labour, working, for example, in uh, fast food outlets or the food production sector, um, domestic servitude, forced and compulsory marriage, so someone being compelled to marry someone else, forced mm -hmm. crime, pickpocketing, cannabis grow houses and so on. There are some preconceptions around this subject, aren't there? I mean, just tell us about some of them. Well, the preconception is that it's not our problem, not a UK problem, mm. but actually that's entirely wrong. The National Referral Mechanism, the um, safeguarding process that we have in the UK for looking after victims of modern slavery and human trafficking, the second highest number of entrants into that system are British citizens. Wow. Uh, and the other preconception is who are the victims? Mm. It can be anyone, you, me. It's someone caught in a moment of vulnerability and exploited. So that is how people become victims, through being caught in a, in a vulnerable situation, in a vulnerable moment? Absolutely. Uh, it could be um, a young girl in the back of a taxi, um, had a pretty rotten night on her night out and falls into sexual grooming. It can be someone with mental health problems. Someone deceives and lies to them about what options are available to them and they're taken advantage of. Someone deploys their means of controlling a vulnerable individual and takes advantage of them. Caroline, you worked on one of Europe's biggest cases of modern day slavery. What, what can you tell us about that case? So Operation Fort concerned the trafficking into the United Kingdom and subsequent exploitation of approximately 350, 400 victims, nearly all male. We had maybe three or four females. They were recruited in Poland by the organized crime group um, told that there was a job waiting for them in the UK, working, sorting rubbish, earning about £350 a week with accommodation and food in, uh, included. When we talk about the accommodation, we've got some Im images here, haven't we, Caroline? We Just do. This, this is the it. accommodation. So shocking. It is shocking. They would uh, travel at short notice to the UK, be picked up at Birmingham train, uh, bus station and then be taken to accommodation like this. This, in fact, is a two-bedroom flat where 70, oh, forgive me, house where 17 people were living. Wow. No it's running water. shocking, it really is. No electricity. We had one of our victims washing in the canal, um, taking food from bins to survive. Just absolute squalor. We've also got an image um, which shows numerous cards that, that were found. What's going on here? So one of the means by which control was exerted is that the victims would be taken to open bank accounts. They'd give the correct name, but a different false address as in an address controlled by the organised crime group would be used so that their banking documents would be sent to the postal address. And each of these cards, when you turn them over, has the pin code in the back. And the wages of the victims, who were working hard days, actually sorting rubbish or making um, fence panels, would be directed, misdirected into those bank accounts and the organised crime group would take the money, maybe £300 a week and give the victims £10 a week to live on. It's absolutely awful. It's really chilling. If you could give any advice for people that might be trying to look out for or recognise signs of someone being a victim to this type of crime, what would you say? First thing I'd say is don't be scared to do what we do best. Ask how are you? Mm. Ask if someone has their identity documents. Do they look like someone who's being paid the full wage? Are they being properly presented? Can they move freely and change their circumstances? Are they getting the minimum wage? Is what they're here doing what they signed up for? And finally, who should we contact? We're really lucky. We have a number of options available to us. We have Crime Stoppers. We obviously have the police ringing 999. And we also have something called the Modern Slavery Helpline, mm. which is a dedicated helpline with trained professionals whose sole specific role is to deal with either the complaints of modern slavery and human trafficking or the victims themselves, triaging them and directing them to the best place. Caroline, it's been so good to talk to you. Thank you for just shedding some, some light on what is a very complicated crime and, and giving us some clarity. Really appreciate it. Thanks.
uh, now how technology is helping provide an insight into some of the most complex of crimes. It was seen as an escalation of capability, the sophistication within those weapons. Those 3D animations actually show that they were working viable guns. My name is Professor Mark Williams. I work at the University of Warwick. I started my career as an engineering apprentice. I then joined the university over 20 years ago and established my own research group to uh, investigate 3D scanning, 3D printing, and working in the 3D space. I'm very much focused on automotive and aerospace, but quite recently, the last uh, phase of my career, moved into criminal forensics. Micro CT scanning is very, very similar to hospital CT scans or CAT scans, except we use much stronger X-rays and we take thousands of X-rays at different projections and then we reconstruct all those individual X-ray images into a 3D high-resolution X-ray that we can use for subsequent analysis. Over 10 years ago, I, I came to work um, to the office, a very typical day, it was a Monday morning, and then the phone rang and there was a detective who uh, introduced himself who worked as a homicide police in West Midlands. He'd heard about this X-ray technology. He had a case that um, would I be interested in supporting, so it took me all of half a second to come up with a decision. Why, you know, why would you not want to get involved with something like that? There was a, a mixed emotion of you know, natural excitement, but also nervousness. This is real life homicide investigation, so I think it's only natural to be you know, quite concerned and think about how, what you'd be involved in, what would you see, and um, what would be the eventual outcome of the case. Once we were, we were on board, and it became apparent that um, this was a very violent dismemberment. The remains were recovered in two suitcases uh, from a canal in Birmingham. What was interesting about this particular case was there was a missing piece of shoulder bone. And after searching the address of the suspect, there was a bonfire in the back garden and some very, very badly damaged charred remains. These scanners are invaluable forensically because we can look on what the human eye can see. And also, we don't handle or touch the specimens. So in terms of evidence continuity, we are not tampering with the evidence. This piece of charcoal was shipped over um, to us for scanning, and then after we analysed and looked at the results, we could clearly see that there were human remains contained within that sample. What you can see here is a, th a 3D print of the shoulder bone recovered in the burnt remains and the charcoal, and what we have here is some of the CT scan of the remains recovered in the suitcase, and you can clearly see there's a perfect match which helped prove that the, uh, the remains recovered at the suspect's address were, the, in fact, those of the victim. Seeing it presented to the jury, our evidence being critical in getting justice to the victim and getting the conviction was a, you know, a very, very proud moment. You've seen how visualizations that we can create from our CT scans are very, very helpful to the jury when explaining very complex and sometimes very distressing cases. Back in 2023, we were contacted by Westminster Police who'd recovered some suspicious looking weapons from an address along with some 3D printing equipment. We'd read about cases of 3D printed guns being produced, but this was the first uh, case of its type that we'd been involved in. Police wanted to understand were these viable weapons, were they able to be shot? When we started to filter away the plastic components, you can see what a, what a sophisticated a piece of manufacturing that this, this really is. From first glances, you can see all the elements of a viable weapon are, are in there. You've got, a, you've got a, a recoil mechanism, you've got a barrel, and you've got all the, you know, the sophisticated components that you would expect within a typically a fired weapon. When looking at the sentencing and the scale of the crime, those 3D animations are really, really important um, tool to explain to the jury and the judge what these weapons were capable of and actually show that they were working viable guns. Ten years ago, when we, we did our first case, I would never have thought that I would end up working in forensics, not only that, but to providing expert witness uh, statements to some really important homicide trials. 350 cases later, over 30 police forces is real testament to how valuable we are. I would say we've had a huge impact 
really excited to see how, how this uh, journey continues and how this, this partnership evolves. Some great and fascinating work from the team there. Now, I'm joined by Dr. Madeline Robles from the University of West England, Bristol, who's a senior lecturer in forensic science. Now, her specialism is 3D computer modeling, which she uses to try and identify remains. Welcome to Crime Watch, Madeline. So how does your type of 3D modeling work? Yep. So in my field of forensic anthropology, we examine skeletal remains to assist law enforcement in providing identification to those unknown remains. And one way we do that is by CT scanning those remains and building a 3D model from which we base our examination from. Okay, well, we can actually see one of those 3D models now in the studio. Here it is. This is the sort of thing that you can create. And we can see straight away as we turn it, there's an awful lot of detail that we can see there when you really look close. And there's a lot of benefits from you doing this mm -hmm. type of work with something like this, aren't there? Yes, definitely. So like, as you could see, it was it's a very accurate representation and we can still manipulate um, and maneuver the 3D model in a similar way we would when we're handling physical remains. Um, and so because of this kind of 3D format now, um, there's a lot of benefits in terms of reducing the risk of contamination and preserving that integrity of the forensic evidence um, because there's less physically uh, physical handling, mm. uh, there's less physical transport of those remains. So, so you could share this type mm -hmm. of image, this creation, you could actually send across the world, really, for someone to view it, exactly. where previously you'd have to send the physical item. Yes, we'd either have to send the physical item or bring in those experts to provide those secondary opinions. So how could something like this aid with an investigation into remains? Yes, so as I mentioned earlier, um, as a forensic anthropologist, we try to examine the skeletal remains. So one of the first things we do is trying to provide a sex estimation. And by doing that, we look at these key traits across the skull. Um, and so those key traits include the or, uh, glabella and the supraorbital ridge. So, so that's, that's the area just above the eyebrows. Exactly. Yeah. And then we have the supraorbital margin, which is located just beneath your eyebrows. Okay. We've got the mental eminence, which is your chin. Okay. And the mastery processes, which are just beneath your ears. And then finally, the nuchal crest, which is located at the back of the skull. So these are the, the five key areas. So if you mm -hmm. were to find some remains, Looking at those individual five areas, any of those that you can work with, would give you a good indication of the sex of that person, where previously that would have been very difficult yes, to do. Yes, exactly. So we score these traits on a scale from one to five, basically grading the robusticity. So we're looking at um, how uh, robust these traits are versus how muted or soft they are. That's absolutely fascinating. Now, at the moment, everything that you do, it, it's not evidential as such, but it certainly gives the police a really good direction, doesn't it, with their investigations? Yeah, absolutely. So one thing we try to do is build this biological profile, and the sex estimation is part of that biological profile, but we also try to provide an age estimation. We try to provide a potential stature and identify any other pathology or, or trauma that may exist on the skeleton with the idea that we compile all this information to uh, give to the investigating officers where they can then compare it to missing persons databases or medical records to uh, hopefully facilitate um, identification of those unknown remains. Yeah, it's a point in the right direction and then mm -hmm. it opens up a lot of doors. It's absolutely fascinating work that you do and uh, thank you for coming in and sharing it with us. Thank you. Now, another innovation snagged a thief posing as a food takeaway driver now, as he literally took stuff away. He was a predator. He had a hunting ground. Without technology to help us solve this, he would have been free to carry out his crimes and we would never have caught him. In November 2023, police received a report of a burglary at a block of student flats in Cardiff. Detective Sergeant Andy Coakley and his team were assigned to investigate. 
This burglary specifically related to a male uh, gaining entry to the premises pertaining to be a maintenance worker or painter. One student didn't think to challenge him because he had a paint pot with him and seemed legitimate. He was gone for 10 minutes. When he returned back to his flat, he found his room had been ransacked and quite a substantial amount of money and other items were stolen, which were worth hundreds and hundreds of pounds. As you can imagine, he was quite devastated. Luckily, there was CCTV and looking at that CCTV, we knew a male was responsible. We knew he was on his own. We knew he was using a bike to travel from place to place. What we didn't know is his identity. The fact that the man had clearly planned the theft using a disguise made detectives suspect he may be an experienced thief. When they searched for reports of similar crimes across the city, those suspicions were confirmed. The more we looked into it, the more we saw a pattern emerging. That then was a massive eureka moment because we, we realised that he was actually very active and he was committing quite a lot of crime. The CCTV evidence that we were obtaining was overwhelming. What he was doing interestingly and uniquely in relation to this was he was pretending to deliver food for some quite well-known organisations. The thief would gain access to buildings and then steal parcels that had been left outside residents' flats, all whilst pretending to be a food delivery driver. This individual was waiting until the coast was clear, placing the bag upon the floor and filling it with the parcels. He was trespassing, he was stealing, he was burgling. The thief targeted some buildings more than once and appeared to be doing everything he could to avoid being caught. He is aware that there are cameras and tries not to look at it. He's trying to partially hide his face. Other times he looks at the CCTV camera directly, which eventually led to his downfall. With a clear image of the thief's face and concerns he would likely strike again, detectives decided to use facial recognition technology comparing his photo to those held on the police database. So retrospective facial recognition came into force a few years back. What it does is it gives us an opportunity to identify persons potentially responsible for any incident, as long as they're captured on CCTV or photograph, and we will then submit a still image of that person to our identification unit, and then they can run it through the software, and then it'll give us a potential of who we should be looking at. The facial recognition was a success and identified the man captured on CCTV as Philip Thompson. Looking into Philip Thompson's history, police had been in contact with him in the past, but we also crucially identified he was a convicted burglar and that he was extremely active in a certain part of Cardiff. Face recognition technology is not admissible in court but it gave detectives the lead they needed to gather further evidence so they could charge him. Now the hunt was on to find him. It was a case of going to known associates' addresses, family addresses, addresses that may be linked to him, um, and ultimately trying to get him in before he caused further damage. Thompson was arrested in November 2023 and brought in for questioning. I saw an individual who was furious at being caught. And in the footage, it does show, OK, those parcels being put in to the Just Eat bag. Thompson was very confrontational, had his own idea as to where and when he's committed a criminal offence, to what he considered to be a theft and be a burglary. And I must have been inside the property to deliver for a reason. Once there, if I have taken something, then yes, yeah, fair enough, I've taken something. Okay. What was my reasoning, though, for being at the property? That's all I'm saying to you. I'm not denying that I've taken stuff whilst there. Didn't go over anyone's personal threshold and if anything. I went in the communal area after being involved. It was explained to him. No, no, you're entering a building, you're a trespasser. You shouldn't be in there. 
but then you've stolen things, so you've definitely committed a burglary. And it took a while for him to accept that. He was charged with 11 offences of burglary and remanded in custody. It was then the case took a new twist. Following the caution, he made an offhand remark that uh, he may have committed further offences, but didn't elaborate. It opened then a new line of investigation for us. Suspecting Thompson was responsible for even more offences, they offered him an opportunity known as a TIC or taken into consideration. In other words, admit what you've done and the judge will take that admission into account when you're sentenced. There was a chance for us to identify who's responsible for committing all of these offences. It gives the victim of crime closure that the person responsible for committing the offence is being held to account and identified. Suddenly, Thompson began to talk. He was a lot more uh, receptive. He was extremely keen to make sure that he was able to tell us where he had been active. And it was quite a, an interesting moment in that particular interview because he even volunteered information to suggest that he'd been burglaring in other parts of Cardiff that we did not know he'd been doing. And that in itself opened up a new line of investigation. There was ones on Crewers Road, mm -hmm. okay. Witchers Road, yeah. Cathedral Road, numerous, yeah. Richmond Road, yeah. A couple on Richmond Road. I've never experienced anything like this in my service. Communal area has been entered on the 13th of August, and tools and a bike have been stolen. Are you responsible for that? Yeah, I was going to that. Okay. Do you remember what's happened? He made it clear. He wanted all these matters to be dealt with because he didn't want new matters to be presented to him after he'd been convicted. After reviewing his new admissions, they re-interviewed him about a further 30 offences. He admitted 27. Okay. Do you remember what's happened to the bike? No, I sold the bike. We were looking at 11 charged burglaries and 69 offences that he would take into consideration. To be able to link this person to so many offences and him openly admit to committing those offences, it gives the victim of crime closure. Once that person goes to court, it's to the judge to decide on whether to apply um, any leniency on sentencing or not. Thompson pleaded guilty at Cardiff Crown Court in May 2024 and was sentenced to seven years and one month imprisonment. I'm really proud of my team. It's vitally important for us to do everything we possibly can to identify persons responsible for burglaries, to support victims of crime, and let them know that we do all we can to, uh, to get to the bottom of it. I mean, what a brazen burglar. I'm just glad he got caught. Now, there are some practical tips to help prevent parcel thefts. Um, first of all, track your parcel. Uh, you can also install a video doorbell like this one. It can be connected to your mobile. It's cheaper, it's easier to install than a, a full CCTV system. Um, ensure you or someone else is at home uh, waiting for the delivery. Uh, arrange for your parcel to be delivered to someone you trust. And if you live in a flat, is there a concierge um, who could potentially accept the parcel on your behalf? And finally, use an off-site locker service. Just some simple advice to help keep you safe. Uh, now, all this week, we've been looking at the impacts that Crime Watch has had over the years. And one of those ways is getting information about crimes out to the public. Earlier this week, I chatted to former heptathlete and 400-metre runner Kelly Southerton, who turned to Crime Watch in 2015 after one of her prized possessions was stolen. Yeah, unfortunately, I was a victim of burglary. Um, I was at home at the time and um, I came down the stairs early in the morning, noticed something wasn't quite right, drawers open, some doors open, um, downstairs to some cupboards and I realised I'd been burgled. Um, that not being traumatic enough, I, I searched areas where they may have taken stuff and I noticed I had a, I had like a fruit bowl of medals in um, and they had all gone, um, not just... Um, prominent medals, but mm. medals I'd won as a kid and national medals, and also my Commonwealth gold medal had gone. Oh my gosh. Um, so I was fortunate enough to be able to appeal for it on Crime Watch 10 yeah. years ago. Um, and I, I gave an appeal and on the Tuesday night, I think it was on Monday or Tuesday night, and then the following day, 
Um, it was located in a post box about I mean, a mile away. Did you ever expect, through having the appeal out on the programme, that, that, that this would happen? Not so quickly, because um, it, it was, you know, I, it was a half a mile down the road that someone just shoved it in a post box and, wow. and the postie found it. And uh, you don't ever expect to get that back. And so, no. obviously, having something that's quite sentimental, not just to me, but my family and the support team that got me the gold medal, and it's my only gold senior medal. I've won lots of silver and bronzes. Yeah. It was like, OK, I'm never going to get this back. But to get it back so quickly, I was, I was pretty shocked. And it was through that crime watch appeal, 100%. And to find it just show up in your local post box. Yeah. I mean, that is just something else, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, I'm sure when the postman saw it, it was like, what's this then? This yeah. It's got no stamp on it. Oh, so, wow. Uh, <laughs> there we are with my medal. Quite um, extraordinary. You've actually brought the medal yes. in with you today, haven't you? I have. And just the distress of being a victim of burglary as a whole and having something stolen from you that's, as you say, so sentimental. Yeah, anybody who's been burgled, it, it, that's traumatic enough knowing someone's come in your house, especially when you were there and asleep. But to have something that's not replaceable, mm. you have the memories and I have the photos and I have the awful video with the haircuts. You look lovely. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so this meant a lot. And so this is normally, this was in my mum's care previously. So the only time I had it was, uh, and it got stolen. So I'm just really lucky that I got it back. And it was thanks to the appeal on Crime Watch. I have to say, thanks very much. Oh, thank you so much for, for coming in. I mean, what a story that medal's got. Yeah, it has. It's also, yeah, it got a story of its own. So it's no. like, yeah. Perfect story. Oh, Kelly, thank you so much for thank coming you. in and telling us more and a fantastic result in the end day. Eh? Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so glad we were able to help with that one. And to those at home, please do keep watching because you never know when you might be able to help to solve a crime. Yeah, glad she got it back safe and sound. Now it's Wanted Faces. First, have you seen this man, James Morn, although he uses several nicknames, including JJ and Eddie and the surname Dunford. Police in South Yorkshire want to talk to him in connection with a kidnap and serious assault from September 2023. He's 31, slim build with pale eyes and a faint teardrop tattoo under his right eye and has a bright white dental implants. Maybe you know Saigon Pep Collège. Humberside Police want to speak with him in connection to drug offences. The 22-year-old is slim with short dark hair and dark eyes and is originally from Albania. And last for today anyway is this man, this is Liam Jones. Maybe you know him by his unusual nickname of Brick. South Yorkshire Police have charged him with possession with intent to supply Class A and B drugs. However, he failed to attend court and a warrant has been issued for his arrest. He's 29, stocky and is described as having a prominent nose and very white teeth. He has associates in Barnsley in South Yorkshire, but also abroad in Marbella and Benidorm in Spain. So, if you know where any of these guys are, please do get in touch. The numbers are on screen. Thanks so much for watching today and for all of your calls. Remember, you can catch us on iPlayer for up to 30 days after broadcast. Tomorrow, we shine a light on how even the dark web doesn't provide cover for criminals. Criminals that operate on a dark web, they act with some belief that they are a ghost. We're going to be there to spot them and we're going to be there to capture them. Yes, they will. Join us tomorrow at the same time at 10.45. Bye for now. See you then.